Tonight, a CBC News investigation into the killing of a Sikh separatist in BC, now blocked in India. To us, it just shows the, uh, the lengths that India is willing to go in order to kind of silence that dissent. The Indian government pushes to censor the Fifth Estates documentary on an alleged assassination that triggered a diplomatic showdown. Scammers at a Ukraine call center going after Canadian money. Why do you think that Canada uh, is, is a target? Now a whistleblower reveals how it all works from the inside. That's a pretty dangerous thing to do, I guess. Yes. And new backlash for law blogs. You're assuming we're all thieves. The grocery giant wants to see receipts. Shoppers are seeing red. From CBC News, this is The National with Ian Hennemansing. There is fresh fallout tonight from a CBC News investigation into the killing of a six separatist here in Canada. The Fifth Estate documentary is now blocked on YouTube in India after demand by the Indian government. That documentary revealed exclusive video of the alleged contract killing of Hardeep Singh Nijar. Last year, Canada accused the Indian government of being involved in the shooting. India strongly denied the claim, which erupted in a diplomatic crisis. Lindsay Duncombe takes us through that Fifth Estate investigation and the reaction tonight to news it's now censored in India. A murder in Surrey, British Columbia has sparked a diplomatic crisis between Canada and India. This Fifth Estate documentary investigating the death of Hardeep Singh Nijar is blocked on YouTube in India. Part of a pattern, says one of the documentary subjects. To us, it just shows the, uh, the lengths that India is willing to go in order to kind of silence that dissent. The investigation revealed exclusive CCTV video of the moment Nijar was gunned down outside his Gurdwara in Surrey. Nijar was an activist pushing for an independent Sikh state. The Indian government says he was a terrorist. The killing of a Canadian citizen. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau accused the Indian government of being involved in his death, an accusation India denies. No charges have been laid. Now, a video of Hardeep Singh Nijar's killing in Canada has surfaced. The video, it has been obtained by the Fifth Estate. And the documentary made headlines in India. A spokesperson for CBC says the broadcaster stands by its journalism. YouTube tells CBC News the video was blocked under Section 69A of India's Information and Technology Act. It says action can be taken in the interest of the integrity, defense or security of India. Last year, the Indian government took similar action over a BBC documentary. It examined the Indian Prime Minister's role in anti-Muslim violence two decades ago. The Indian government has gotten pretty aggressive in um, taking advantage of its own laws to pressure social media companies to take down content it doesn't like, to target actual specific users and even have accounts blocked. Activists tell me, Ian, that this isn't just happening with journalism produced outside of India. In fact, one radio broadcaster here in Vancouver who broadcasts in Punjabi told me that he is worried about dissidents inside of India being silenced. All of this happening ahead of elections in India starting next month. And so, Lindsay, what is the Indian government saying about the video? Well, well, we reached out to the consulate here in Canada as well to the government in India, and we haven't heard back. Lindsay Duncombe in our Vancouver newsroom. Justin Trudeau is not backing down from a group of premiers urging him to pause a planned carbon tax hike next month. And as Marina von Stackelberg shows us, he faced the pushback directly today from one of his biggest political rivals. So, so great to see you. Great to see you as well. Within minutes, Alberta's premier brought it up. An area where we don't quite see eye to eye, the, the carbon tax. That fight between the provinces and Ottawa has flared up yet again. Next month, the federal government's carbon tax is scheduled to increase. I do believe that if we're really concerned about affordability and inflation, that the, the tax is just is too high. Trudeau defends carbon pricing as one of the best ways to cut greenhouse gas emissions. He says checks Ottawa has been sending Canadians offset the tax. That's an easy thing for short-term politicians, short-term thinker politicians, to say, oh, we'll get rid of the price. They don't talk about the fact that they're also going to get rid of that check 
the Canada carbon rebate that puts more money in the pockets of the vast majority of Canadians. But some premiers say the rebates aren't enough, especially for Canadians who can't easily switch how they heat their home or what car they drive. It doesn't fully contemplate the induced and indirect costs of living on an island or living in rural and remote areas. Andrew Fury, the latest of seven premiers calling on Ottawa to cancel this spring's carbon tax hike. B.C., the Northwest Territories and Quebec have their own carbon pricing programs, so they're exempt from the federal plan. Nearly all the provinces that aren't now united. I do not understand for the life of me what the federal government is, is thinking. As the federal opposition leader rallies his supporters with his promise to abolish the carbon tax altogether. We know that everybody is going to be much worse off as a result of the carbon tax. Just how much more you'll pay on your energy bill depends on what type of fuel you use. If you plan to fill up your car, expect to pay about one or two dollars more at the pumps. Marina von Stackelberg, CBC News, Ottawa. The Arrive Can app controversy is back in the spotlight on Parliament Hill tonight. MPs grilled one of the partners behind the IT firm that charged millions for the project. JP Tasker takes us through the testimony. Uh, speed to procure with adopting smaller, more agile technology firms. GC Strategies, the biggest contractor hired by the government to develop the Arrive Can app, has finally revealed how much it directly profited. After taxes, after expenses, through dividends. But I've told you it's two point, approximately $2.5 million. And for that, the two-person IT staffing firm says it did less than 10 hours of clerical work a week. Still, company partner Christian Firth called it money well spent. The government obviously sees value in what myself and my firms and firms like us do. So I can't comment on what my hourly wages. I can just comment the fact that we've had 55 contracts prior. Firth defended his company's track record. It's people that are misinformed and misled are the ones who are up, up in arms understanding this. This is There's a cost of doing business, and 636 other firms have the same pr business processes as we do. MPs grilled him over his government connections. You've demonstrated yourself to be a liar. Also revealed in testimony that Firth paid for a whiskey tasting and dinners out with bureaucrats, things he failed to disclose in the past. Why did you lie to this committee? It was not a lie. I just was unaware. I hadn't checked all of my outlook. All this just as Auditor General Karen Hogan, whose damning report on Arrive Can spending prompted this investigation, fired three of her own staff for having government contracts. This political analyst says the mounting ethical concerns over all this could be damaging for the government. Pierre Polyev and the Conservatives will push on, can these people manage a government? If they didn't know this was happening, why not? The Prime Minister now promising action. We have uh, launched investigations and we are rethinking how the public service does procurement and uh, does contracting. The government has now cancelled all contracts with GC strategies and the RCMP has been called in to investigate. J.P. Tasker, CBC News, Ottawa. The U.S. House of Representatives has passed a bill requiring TikTok's owner in China to sell the platform or it will be banned in the United States. Those supporting the measure argue the China-based company could collect and share sensitive user data or censor political content that could influence the upcoming election. The bill now goes to the U.S. Senate. Turning now to the Middle East and the urgent efforts to get desperately needed aid into Gaza. Our CBC News team traveled to Nitzana, near the border between Israel and Egypt, where aid trucks must first be inspected by Israeli forces before eventually crossing into Gaza. This is Israel's offensive in Gaza continues, and a warning, you're about to see the deadly consequences. But first, Margaret Evans takes us to that border where aid trucks are being met by Israeli protesters. A gathering in southern Israel, not a hike or a picnic or a party, but a protest against humanitarian aid reaching Gaza, even though aid agencies say only a trickle is getting in. The protesters are heading for the Egyptian border, some along a faded art installation called the Peace Path. Julia and Sarah say they know people in Gaza are starving. If Hamas were to surrender, if they were to give up, if they were to return the hostages, the war would be over and this situation could be... The world could, could start helping the Gazan civilians, the innocent Gazan civilians. But until then... 
The demonstrators have done this before and come prepared. The gate behind me is the gate between Egypt and Israel. On the other side, there are trucks waiting to come across. They're going to be checked on this side by the Israelis before going back down to another crossing and then into Gaza. The people here demonstrating are trying to stop that from happening. Their numbers are few and Israeli security forces unfazed, but the gate remained shut. We think that this is a bad tactic to be sending in food because we know that they are putting their hands on all of it, or almost all of it. By they, Reuven Frankenberg means Hamas. He calls concern for Palestinians exaggerated. Of course we know what's happening in Gaza, and it's all Hamas's fault. And in war, it's unfortunate civilians die. Inside Gaza, five people were killed and 22 injured when an Israeli strike hit one of the last UN aid depots. Israel says it killed a Hamas commander. But as fears of famine rise in Gaza, Israel is under increasing international pressure to let more aid in. Israel still needs to open as many access points as possible and keep them open to make sure that things are flowing in a sustainable way. After long denying Israel has restricted aid into Gaza, the Israeli military says it will now work to open multiple routes. Margaret Evans, CBC News, on the Israeli-Egyptian border. In Lithuania, police are investigating after a longtime ally of deceased Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny was attacked. <laughs> Authorities say Leonid Volkov was beaten with a hammer outside his home in Vilnius last night. Volkov blames Putin henchmen for the attack. Lithuanian intelligence also say they believe Russia was behind it. The United Nations is evacuating non-essential staff from Haiti, saying the security situation is too volatile. Haiti's unelected prime minister agreed to step down this week, with the country now in the grips of violence and chaos, the capital effectively under the control of armed gangs. CBC News has learned Canada's military is dropping two major requirements to try and attract more recruits. Ashley Burke now with the changes aimed at addressing a crisis in the ranks. You live for experience and lead by example. This is one of the videos Canada's military has used to try to recruit new troops. This is for you. And here in this room is one of the challenges to keeping them. This marks the beginning of the testing session. A one-hour multiple-choice test known as the CFAT. You'll be using the computer in front of you to complete this test. It scores applicants' verbal skills, spatial ability and problem-solving. Traditionally, applicants would have to come into a designated building to take it in person, but many just drop out, says the commander overseeing recruiting. 60% of people who express initial interest in joining the CAF um, don't come in to do their CFAT. Just have a read of the question here. So as part of the trial to reverse dropout rates, the military has scrapped the test during the application process for almost 50 jobs. Recruits will only take it after they've joined up and scores won't matter. I think there will be more people comfortable to come in and put in the application without, uh, while skipping the test portion of things. Military recruitment is now a critical problem. CBC News reported last week on documents that show Canada's readiness is decreasing. Only 58% of the forces is able to respond if called upon by NATO, leading the defence minister to warn the military's been losing more people than it brought in for the last three years. Frankly, it's a death spiral for the Canadian Armed Forces. We cannot afford to continue on that pace. We've got to do something differently. Another one of those things, an overhaul of the military's one-size-fits-all medical standards by early summer. People can serve fully in the CAF with low-risk medical employment limitations um, that right now would be screened out. The military says the new trial will allow more people with pre-existing medical conditions to serve. And Ashley, what more have you learned about those changes when it comes to medical conditions? Well, Ian, Brigadier General Brody says decisions will be made on a case-by-case -case basis and applicants will still need to meet the physical demands of the job. People have complained in the past about being screened out for taking medication for ADHD or anxiety, 
one applicant even said he was ineligible because of a peanut allergy. The defense minister said that these new trials are a good first step, but that more needs to be done to get those recruitment numbers up. Ian? Ashley Burke reporting from Ottawa. Alberta has announced plans to create a new provincial police agency with the ability to support local departments and the RCMP. If it's passed, new legislation would allow for sheriffs to take on more responsibilities. That includes apprehending suspects and highway patrol. The province says the agency would be governed by a civilian oversight board. It also insists this is not a replacement for the RCMP. The City of Montreal has released the results of a months-long crackdown on short-term rentals. This comes after that deadly fire last year in a building with illegal Airbnbs. But as Jennifer Yoon shows us, many say enforcement of the rules is falling short. For months, city inspectors have been cracking down on illegal Airbnbs. Now, new details on the results of that effort. Since August, the task force has carried out 394 inspections, shut down one illegal Airbnb, and written up 42 tickets for fines between one and $4,000. The city is sharing this information with Quebec's revenue agency, which has the power to fine hosts up to $50,000. But it says the province is not following up with them. It wants more information to hold lawbreakers accountable. The government of Quebec, Revenu Quebec and Ministère du Tourisme has to do their part to make sure that their law are respected also. It's been almost a year since seven people were killed in a fire at a building in Old Montreal that had several illegal Airbnbs inside. That sparked a flurry of new legislation to curb illicit short-term rentals. But housing groups say it's still a problem. This brand new building was splattered with anti-Airbnb graffiti. CBC News confirmed with Airbnb there are short-term rentals here. The borough says only three units have a permit. This housing advocate, who organized the protest outside, says he wants to see a total ban. Uh, the community here are really angry because this new building could have been used for housing, but it, instead it's used for tourists. Montreal does allow short-term rentals for those who are renting out their primary residences. But the city says it cannot prove that without Quebec's help. The province says it's up to municipalities to apply their bylaws and that it's doubled its resources to tackle the issue. Why bother having this whole provincial registration system if they're not going to use that information to you know, help enforce local rules? In a statement, Airbnb said it is following Quebec's rules, but no other jurisdiction has a system as cumbersome. Jennifer Yoon, CBC News, Montreal. Dozens of animal welfare groups in Manitoba say they're at a breaking point tonight. There's an overpopulation crisis here. Why some say it's time to declare a state of emergency. Plus, an added check after checkout. You have a good day. Thank you. You as well. Have a nice day. Why Loblaw's new pilot project is getting pushback. You make uh, regular shoppers feel like criminals. And a raccoon with a keen eye for fast food. Yeah, I see him making his way back to me. I said, oh, this is a moment. You like my shoes? We're back in two. Dollar Tree says it's closing a thousand stores across the U.S., the majority under its Family Dollar brand. The discount retailer says the cuts are because it missed holiday profit targets last year. It operates more than 15,000 locations across North America. Canadian stores are not affected. Shoppers at another Canadian retail chain are upset after Loblaw started testing a new security measure. Customers at some stores will soon have to scan a receipt in order to leave. Sophia Harris explains why that's triggering the backlash. Marshall Irwin doesn't like a new feature coming soon to his local Loblaw-owned superstore, a receipt scanner at the self-checkout exit. It said that uh, you had to scan your receipt. Once customers do so, a metal gate will open so they can leave. It's another form of receipt check. I don't think it's ethical and I don't believe that uh, they should be able to do it. Irwin says the scanner at his store isn't activated yet. They're assuming we're all, all thieves. This shopper found the scanner in action at a Loblaw-owned grocery store in Woodstock, Ontario, 
he wasn't impressed. I just introduced so much um, extra chaos. In it. You had some people, especially a lot of elderly folks, were uh, completely unaware this was a new thing and were just pushing their carts through the closed gate. It would trigger alarms. There was alarms going off maybe every one to two minutes. Loblaw confirmed to CBC News it's testing the scanner in four stores to try to combat theft fueled by organized crime. It didn't provide data. Last year, Loblaw was among several stores that tried receipt checks done by staff. You have a good day. Thank you. you. U.S. Grocer Safeway has already introduced receipt scanners in some of its stores. These measures have also sparked customer backlash. This consumer advocate says with rising grocery prices, retailers should avoid anti-theft tactics targeting all shoppers. The fact that you make uh, regular shoppers feel like criminals, that takes it a step too far. Customers already feel imprisoned enough by high prices. He also says Loblaw can't prevent shoppers from leaving. If they're stopping you and you feel like you don't have an ability to leave and uh, there is no basis for them to detain you, that qualifies as false imprisonment. Loblaw didn't say what happens to people who refuse to scan their receipt or what customers do if they didn't buy anything and have no receipt. People we spoke with say they just hope the grocer's test run is short-lived. Sophia Harris, CBC News, Vancouver. Parts of Manitoba are dealing with an overpopulation of stray dogs. This becomes a situation where um, a packing of dogs can happen. The risks to safety and what's being done about it. Next. Plus a call center in Ukraine scamming Canadians out of their savings. This guy's been paid me more than $150,000. A former employee takes us inside the operation. We know who is uh, behind this. And a heavily sanctioned Russia skirting restrictions and showing off. We are thriving now. The National breaks down the story shaping our world. Next. Searching for a heart of Neil Young is returning to Spotify two years after boycotting the music streaming service. He was one of several artists to remove their catalogs, complaining that Joe Rogan's podcast was spreading vaccine misinformation on the platform. Young says this is not a reversal of his position. He says other music services now also spread disinformation. Manitoba is grappling with an overpopulation of stray dogs. That is, dozens of animal welfare groups say they're out of resources and out of money. Cameron McIntosh now with their urgent plea for help. Not necessarily problem dogs, but the sheer number of them is causing problems in some parts of rural Manitoba. So there's an overpopulation crisis here in Manitoba. Karina Grawinski leads one of 45 animal welfare agencies calling for a $2.5 million increase in provincial funding for spaying and neutering. There's lack of vet care uh, in, in many rural communities. Um, and what happens is, is that this becomes a situation where um, a packing of dogs can happen. In situations that have gone unchecked, there have been cases of dogs turning feral, resulting in attacks as dog rescue agencies say they're unable and under-resourced to keep up. We're basically on our own running volunteer organizations to the best of our ability, but some days it feels like we are really failing. And running up against a lack of space to foster rescues in other communities. The Winnipeg Humane Society, Manitoba's largest shelter, is at capacity. We will continue to work on behalf of animals that have been abandoned. The provincial government says it's working to expand a rural spay and neuter program. More details are expected in next month's budget. While Winnipeg itself isn't being overrun, the head of Animal Services says there could be better coordination of local bylaws governing breeding, licensing, and provincial supports. If you had basic laws like that, um, plus you had high volume spay and neuter being brought in by rescues and the government, you'd see those populations go down over time. In the meantime, animal welfare groups say given the risk for bites and attacks, parts of rural Manitoba should be considered under a state of emergency. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. Now it's time to dig deeper into the stories shaping our world. How Russia's wartime economy chugs along from dodging sanctions to feeding soldiers. We are thriving now. 
But first, from a call center in Kyiv, they sell dreams of easy wealth. Why do you think that Canada uh, is, is a target? A whistleblower reveals how the seduction works. They have to get first time deposit. And how much they're raking in. <laughs> That's crazy. This is The Breakdown. And this investigation comes to us from our colleagues at Radio Canada. Reporter Jeff Yates did the legwork, but it's Alexis Delancé who explains how it all goes down. So when you realized that uh, it was criminal, you decided you're going to investigate it from the inside? Yes. That's a pretty dangerous thing to do, I guess. Yes. But even at the beginning, I didn't realize how it was dangerous. For a few months in 2019, Alex worked in a scam call center in Kyiv. He decided to become a whistleblower after witnessing fraud there. He wanted to talk to Canadian journalists to share what he's seen. Jeff went to meet him in a non-disclosed location in Europe. The presentation was that this is financial company. They had never been talking about scams, about uh, something suspicious. suspicious. Then I started to work on the sales. And about uh, one month, it was clear that this scam. Alex collaborated with Swedish journalists who helped him smuggle a hidden camera inside the call center. He then spent the following weeks documenting what goes on inside. Walk us through how these call centers work, you know. Tell us exactly how they function. Normally one call center is about 150 people. They have uh, about 100 on the sales. I mean, the people who to get a list of the potential victims. Fraudsters target victims on social media. They publish ads that look like news articles promising exciting new investment opportunities involving cryptocurrencies. Many people click on these ads, tempted by promises of risk-free and lucrative investments. Without realizing it, they've just taken their first step into a dangerous trap. They have to get FTD. Sorry? FTD from okay. the victim. First time deposit. First time deposit. From 50 to 150 more US dollars. In 2022, our colleagues at La Facture showed what happens on the other end of the line when Canadian victims get scammed. Au bout de deux trois semaines, le 250 avait plus que doublé. Le portefeuille grandissait, grandissait, grandissait. C'est presque de l'hypnose. To create the illusion that this is a real and profitable investment scheme, the fraudsters send the victims fake charts which seem to show their portfolio grow. Even though they look very credible, the gains are fictitious. What are the techniques that they use to, uh, to manipulate people into putting more and more money? First quality is uh, to get trust from the victim, befriend that victim. Hello. How are you doing? He's top scammer. Talking to the client. Okay. The division. I want to tell you something important. Uh, I'm really happy that I know you in this year, and I really want you to have a really beautiful year in 2020, and we make our business together bigger. I understand it was some stuff that bad happened this year, and I wish that in 2020, you and your family, all of you. You'll have a beautiful year, and I wish you that you will reach each by each one of your wishes. So he calls him on December 31st. Yes. He didn't even ask him for money. What what was he doing there? He pretended to be friend, not just a financial yeah. advisor, but to be friend. I wish you a really good time, brother, and speak to you on Wednesday. Come up here. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye bye. This guy, he paid me more than $150,000. Wow. <laughs> and how much money would this uh, this top guy, how much money would he have made out of this guy? 8%. 8%. 
So he would have made something like 10, 15,000? Yes. <laughs> That's crazy. J'avais les yeux sur le portefeuille. J'avais confiance et puis finalement, ça allait bien. Everything seems fine. That is, until victims tell the scammers that they want to withdraw their profits. Et là, il me dit, d'accord, aucun problème. Il dit, il faut juste régler la question des, des impôts. J'ai dit, mais vous prendrez euh, vos impôts sur le montant qui est dans mon compte, il a aucun problème. Ah, il dit, non, ça, il dit, ça on ne peut pas faire ça. Ça ne faisait pas de sens, là, le raisonnement qu'il me faisait. J'ai réalisé qu'il y avait une arnaque, puis ça m'est euh, arrivé comme une révélation. Tout ce que j'ai investi, je l'ai perdu. C'était tout près d'un million. So, just to be clear, these are not real investment companies. This is all 100% scams. Yes. I have never seen the real financial companies. All money that those companies get from the victims go to the crypto, go to cash, go to the criminals, go to Authorities. You talked to us about a call center in Kiev um, that is targeting Canadians. Tell us a bit about what, what we know. We know who is uh, behind this. We know where the office is. We know, I know the story about this office. And this is uh, one of the call centers in Kiev who is going after Canadians. This call center is located in a nondescript building in downtown Kyiv, in Ukraine, alongside several businesses, including a bank. It uh, has been placing uh, ads uh, for jobs, for English speaking, and it's about Canadian markets. We used a false identity to respond to one of these advertisements on Telegram. The ad made it clear that they were exclusively targeting Canadians. Nicholas applied, assuming the identity of Ari Farki, an Italian citizen based in Rome, who had already worked in similar call centers. After a few back and forth messages, Nicholas receives the call from the manager of this call center. Hello. Hi Ari, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm not doing too bad yourself. Amazing. We can uh, see you. what are your qualifications. Uh, moreover than that, the ways that you are taking money from the clients. So anything that you can come up with, tell me. After detailing his supposed work experience, Nicholas got straight to the point. He asked about the precise objectives of this Kyiv-based call center. From what I gather, you guys are aiming more uh, for Canadians, right? Yeah, that's true. And it's only night traffic, night shifts in Kyiv. Yeah, and I was just wondering about the whole inflation situation is worrying people, and I was just wondering if that was something that was affecting your business or if more people were investing because of that, or...? I wouldn't say that there is much more difference. No. <laughs> Look, this business is working already for how long? The same advertisement and the same everything. So it's like, look, stupid people, you're always looking for some kind of uh, whatever that they can invest, do nothing, and bring in more, more money for you. It's, it's never, it's never changed. Even though the advertisement, even the affiliate, it never changed the advertisement. I don't know why, but it's still working. Why do you think that Canada uh, is is a target? Because law enforcement uh, has no real persecutions of the scammers. You tried to reach out to Canadian authorities with some information. Um, what information did you send, and what happened? So I sent information to the um, particular website. I, didn't, I think it was Antifraud Center, offering uh, information that I gathered on the, the crimes they committed uh, against Canadians. Mm -hmm. But I got no feedback. Jeff, some viewers may be wondering, how, how do people fall for this? I know you've been covering this type of fraud for, for more than three years now, so what's the answer to that? Well, you know, falling for a scam has little to do with intelligence. People fall for scams for a variety of reasons. Like we saw in the piece, you know, some people are just looking for a friend to talk to. Uh, some people are also find themselves in a crisis in their lives. We heard a story through our reporting of 
a woman who lost all her money trying to raise cash to pay for experimental treatments for her for her cancer. So, you know, um, it's important to know that these scammers are professional manipulators. They know how to find victims when they're at their most vulnerable. And it can really happen to anybody to find themselves in such a situation at some point in their lives. Really good points, Jeff. Thank you very much. Thank you. With sanctions mounting, Russia's economy is adapting. We understand that uh, Putin's government needs drones. The shifting strategy to maintain their war efforts. Why Russia can seem like a land of plenty in spite of all those sanctions. Russian ham, avocado. You'll see how the Kremlin retooled the economy for war. If you are friends with China, there is no short shortage. But war has also driven out workers. As the West does its best to choke off Russian trade, Briar Stewart breaks down how the country adapts. At least on the surface, life in Russia's capital seems very much status quo. Vladimir Putin is about to be re-elected again for a fifth term as president. Stores are busy and shelves are full, but people are paying more. Prices for everything have increased greatly, he said. But there are still plenty of keen shoppers, including those who can splurge on products from Western companies that have pulled out of the Russian market because businesses have been able to adapt. At first, we had problems. Many European transport companies closed their businesses with us, said Roberto Megliona, an importer who found new routes to bring Italian products, including cheese, to the Russian market. We are thriving now. Marina Lubanovskaya is part of a group of Russians who put out videos on YouTube for an English-speaking audience. In her case, she says she's trying to dispel Western rumors about Russia suffering under sanctions. I love this abundance. This store in Moscow is owned by Globus, a German chain which still operates around 20 stores in Russia. Lubanovskaya admits prices have gone up, but insists Russians aren't missing out. Russian ham, avocado. She shows off some of the groceries she recently purchased for a few dollars, including Russia's own replacement for Coca-Cola, which pulled out of the country. You see the bottle is uh, very similar and the taste uh, as well. This is zero sugar. Cheers. Lubanovskaya is a travel agent who said all of the European travel restrictions have made her pivot. She now books clients trips to Asia instead. That's also where Russia has boosted its trade. If you are friends with China, there is no short shortage with the computers and uh, different devices. Chinese cars now account for about half of Russia's car market. While Russia shores up its new trading partners abroad, at home it's ramped up spending on the military. One third of the budget is going towards the war effort. Everything is for the front, everything is for victory, said one lawmaker. Some military factories are working around the clock, churning out tanks, ammunition and drones. This bakery south of Moscow has also stepped up production. It was already baking bread for Russian soldiers and now it's converted part of its floor space into a drone factory. The city of Izhevsk lies 100 kilometers east of Moscow. It's already home to Kalashnikov, Russia's biggest producer of automatic weapons and guided artillery. And now three of its malls have been bought up by drone manufacturers, much to the dismay of many local residents. Well, the first reaction was why our city gets a big target for, uh, uh, for attacks. Ivan Elisiv is an anti-corruption activist who released an investigation into what was happening with the malls. Tenants had their leases terminated and the drone manufacturers moved in. They, they understand that uh, Putin's government needs drones and they will have uh, uh, more money. 
In the fall, Putin toured one facility where a new long-range kamikaze drone is being produced. He and other officials frequently visit factories showing off equipment and boasting about resilience. Uh, Putin has money to continue to fulfill um, its war machine. To... Alexandra Prokopenko used to work as an advisor at Russia's central bank. She says the country's biggest economic lifeline has been its ability to sell its oil to new markets and use a shadow fleet to help skirt around the Western price cap. If the sanctions would be successful and if the demand on the Russian oil would lower, uh, it's all reduced Putin's um, capacity to finance the war. But not now. Prokopenko left Russia after the invasion, just like hundreds of thousands of others who didn't want to be part of a country waging war or shut out from the West. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This group in Baku, Azerbaijan, is celebrating the two-year anniversary of a co-working space they've dubbed New Zion, a nod to the Matrix movies where Zion was the last human city in a world taken over by machines. Most of the people here are Russian and work in the tech sector. After Russia announced it was mobilizing men in the fall of 2022, many here hurriedly left including some on two chartered planes that Aras Mamet helped to organize. That was the moment when we had like a, maybe 300, 400 people asking us to help. In the end, 110 people booked a seat, each paying 2,500 US. Most people here, they're business people. They don't want any politics, involvement, engagement, activities. So these people just want peace and they want to be like in a safe place to work and run their businesses. It's not clear whether they will return once the war is over. The mass exodus has helped to create record low unemployment in Russia. A lack of workers along with inflation is putting pressure on the country. But Russia's economy is not on the brink of collapse. And for now, it still has enough money to keep fueling the war it started. But Briar Stewart tells us Russia's revenues are vulnerable. Ukraine has been escalating its drone attacks on major oil refineries. The latest did so much damage they pushed up the price per barrel. That ability to strike at Russia's rich resource is a wild card in this war. Next, a change in tone as a raccoon pays a visit to a busy McDonald's. Everyone is saying, oh, give him a burger. <laughs> it's a hunt for a handout in our moment. No, that's not. Well, oh, here's a raccoon getting up close and personal with diners at a McDonald's in a Toronto suburb. It casually strolled in, perhaps looking for a burger and fries, but made a beeline for Amin Hadji as he recorded the whole thing. And tonight, the uninvited guest is our moment. Hi. What are you doing here? That day, I seen a gentleman. He come to, to work and he said, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. What? He said, a raccoon followed me to the McDonald's. I said, okay, so we'll do whatever you have to do. And then the, one of the stuff, uh, he came with the chicken nuggets, I think so. And he tried to make him follow it. Till the end, almost to the door, and then yeah, I see him making his way back to me. I said, oh, this is a moment. <laughs> the lady with whom I was talking, she was almost going to jump. I told her, no, 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 because he may attack. That, that, that's for my son. OK, come over here. Why did you let it come so close to you? I didn't let it come close to me. It came close to me. <laughs> anyway, he was very, very, very quiet, very, like, perfect client like <laughs> no, no troubles i mean he's smiling people in the mcdonald's seem to be like okay with it but if you've ever seen a video of a raccoon that's been cornered like you don't want to be any uh, close to that it's also interesting how raccoon wild animals shouldn't be in the mcdonald's people tolerate that like imagine if it was can i say it if it was a rat how different the reaction would be anyway Thank you for being with us. You can watch anytime, anywhere on the free CBC News app and subscribe to the Nationals' YouTube channel. I'm Ian Hanamansing in Vancouver. Good night.